are full profs. Those are full professors at PhD granting institutions. And then we see the number of women versus men who um, received the AMS prize in 2020. That's a big increase because in 2019, there were no women. So that went up in by 19% or you know, in just uh, one year. So we know what the problem is. Women are underrepresented in mathematics. So where does this come from? So to be honest with you, this is my early view of STEM. So I thought about when I recognized women being represented in STEM was an issue. So I broke it up on the left-hand side. This is from sixth grade to 12th grade. So if you look at this picture, as a middle schooler or a high schooler, I had no idea because the majority of my teachers in the STEM field were women. And of course you would say, yes, Reagan, that's what happens in secondary education. But at that time, why would I know any differently, right? Women are educators, there are some men, but I looked into my STEM courses, I had one male teacher, he taught me sixth grade math. And technology and the engineering, I just lumped those together. There was an architecture drafting lettering class and I took some programming classes in high school as well. As you see, and I look at the balance, there are black women, white women, and I actually had an Asian woman who was um, my physics teacher in high school. So to me, thinking about women being underrepresented in STEM did not make sense. My aunt is an engineer. My mom and, my, and her twins, or my aunt's twin sister, studied computer science. So women in my life were doing math and they were doing hard math. So for me, doing mathematics wasn't anything that I could not do. To be honest with you, I was challenged by math in eighth grade because I went from seventh grade math to algebra and I didn't have any pre-algebra and I struggled um, actually. And my eighth grade teacher, Gwendolyn Scott, black woman she is the one who was like you can do this this is what we're going to need to do and you're going to get over the hump so at that time women being underrepresented in math did not make um any sense to me at all now i'll tell you my age i graduated from high school in 1998 so while i'm thinking that there's women or not even knowing this is a problem this is what the mathematics department looked like at princeton in 1996. So I'm like, women can do math. Of course they can do math. My calculus teacher was a black woman. And in high school, you know, like, oh my gosh, I reached the pinnacle of math. I've taken the highest math they can offer. And a woman is teaching me this. And she was fierce, let me tell you. She did not play. There was no calculators. I remember doing like limit proofs in high school. And it's like, who, what is the epsilon? Why do we want to talk about this? Just tell me what's the shortcut. Plug it in, keep going, right? What's the limit trick? But I remember doing that and being taught by a woman. So to know that this was happening in 1996 was just something that I didn't know. I was completely oblivious. I went to Xavier University of Louisiana in New Orleans. My family has um, great ties to Xavier. My great, my dad's parents and so my grandparents met at what's known as Xavier Prep. So it was kind of natural. And I, after having such a positive experience in middle school with Mrs. Scott, I'm going to go be a math teacher. And that is what my goal was. I wanted to motivate students just like her. When I got to college, they would say, well, you can do more. Okay, what is more? You can be a faculty member, you go to graduate school. My dad has a master's degree um, in architecture, industrial education, architecture, something like that. It's a shame I don't know exactly what it is. But going to graduate school wasn't a new thing to me. Going, the new thing was like leaving home to go to, go, like I leave home to go to school. But okay, this is what you do. And those things, my mentors were telling these things in my mind, okay, I'm gonna keep working toward it. But when I looked at the math majors, I only recall there during my four years being three male math majors, just three. Xavier's small, but the women were running the show. So again, women being underrepresented in mathematics just didn't make any sense to me. And then I looked at the faculty as I was preparing this talk and I was like, oh, well, maybe my light bulb should have went off then, right? There weren't as many women. So what happened? Did, what was this ceiling that they couldn't make? They can teach me in high school, but they can't make that leap to get the PhD to teach me in undergrad. That's something that I recognize now. But at the time, it was more, this is not women. what women choose to do. It's not that there was no place for them there, right? I remember my mentors, um, they were telling me, this is what you do. 
you do this program, you apply for this. And I just did the things that they told me to do because they were successful. They were going to graduate school, positive stories, doing great things. So in my mind, women always belonged in math or there was never a question about them belonging in math. So then this is when I had my great epiphany. I went to the Nebraska Conference of Undergraduate Women in 2001. My research advisor, who was also my calculus one in three professor said, you should go. So I went, I gave a talk on my research and I was like, yes, this is great. And I learned all these stories of the challenge that women were facing being underrepresented in mathematics. I had two shocks. Why don't I hear about this as Xavier? And when I got to the conference, where are the black women? I was like, what? Like I was unprepared for how cold it was in Lincoln, Nebraska, but I wasn't prepared to be maybe one or two of the women, black women that were there. So this is where, I don't know if you can see my hand, this is where I am like right there, that's me. I just was not prepared for that because I came from a place where women did math and there were brown women that were doing math. Yes, I recognize, okay, Reagan, you grew up in Louisiana, New Orleans was the population, yes, but there are white people in New Orleans, let's be for real. I mean, that Tulane is down the street, you have you know Loyola, they have schools where people are doing mathematics. You went to HBCU, yes, I did, but I still saw, this is gonna sound bad, but I still saw integration at Tulane and Loyola and all those other schools. So when I went to NCWM, I was like this, oh my gosh. And I was questioning, is this a field that I really wanna go into? Not because I didn't think I was capable, but it was more about, do I have a place here? So you told me that women have issues, okay? But now where are the brown women? Where are the black women? How am I gonna navigate this? So I knew NCWM was addressing the problem, but I still felt that time, February, 2001, that's when I really began to question if this is a path that I really wanna take. I did, but I didn't go without my questions. So these are some of the problems that, that have been cited, right? Their personal, social, academic, all these reasons why women and minorities are not successful um, in graduate programs. One thing that you know that stands out to me because I know of people who've experienced this, they slip through the cracks in that they are not as successful. They're not meeting those benchmarks um, that they're supposed to make. So then they just leave and you're like, well, what happened? I thought she would, hmm, well, and then it's not reported in a way that you would know where the women are and sometimes the men. So, and to be honest, I went to University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, going to the NCWM was my pathway, was my exposure to UNL because otherwise, I mean, I knew where Nebraska was on the map from you know, geography, but why would I go to Nebraska? That wasn't somewhere that I was on my mind to go. So doing NCWM, I did a summer program and then I came there for graduate school. So that set the track um, for me to go. But there were male students there that I know that were outstanding, but they didn't get the PhD. Why? So it's not, just the women that fall through the clack. Sometimes men fall through the clack, but it's just more prominent when the women um, through do fall through these cracks. And then there are these barriers that you don't know how to navigate. And that's really um, true because I went from a place where being black didn't matter, right? We were all students because everybody in the room was black. And then you go to a place where I have to learn, I have to make this big jump because the learning curve is great but I stand out. I don't wanna think about that I'm black. I know that, but it's not something that I had to think about so much. And I tell people all the time, I knew I was black, but I did not know I was black until I got to Lincoln, Nebraska, because that's something that, how I say this, that I was reminded of, not necessarily within the department, but just being in that space that I reminded, that I was reminded that, um, that I am black. So, here comes EDGE. Now EDGE happened, the first EDGE session happened in 1998, but EDGE happened, Sylvia and Rhonda had met before and there was a program before EDGE 
that uh, most people don't know about. So we call it the baby edge and then the edge program. So Rhonda and Silvio had students, female students who were doing well at their respective institutions. Silvio's at Spelman and Rhonda's at um, Bryn Mawr and they were doing well, but then they got to graduate school and you're like, what is happening? She's one of my best students. What is happening? Oh, we have to have this talk with her to say, okay, now you've made it through the first semester. Now let's have our pep talk and let's go back. You're gonna to continue to do this. What are we not doing to prepare our students, mainly female students, and especially the minority of female students to be successful as they pursue PhDs in mathematical sciences? So initially the goal was to get them through the first year. And after they got through the first year, they're like, now we need to keep going. So the goal, the mission is to get them through to the PhD. So this is what EDGE is. A lot of people only know EDGE as the summer session and that's where it starts, but that is not all of EDGE. So the summer session is the, the glue, the heartbeat, that what keeps it together. But we have a reunion and all these other things that you see um, on this diagram. So the summer session is where it all begins, but that's the, not but, that is the entry point into the community. So I'll talk about some of these as we um, go. More, I'm gonna say it more importantly, but the summer session and the lifelong mentor network are what people tend to remember the most. The travel support. So there are many grants that EDGE supp uh, supplies for students that wanna go to conferences or they may need to take a little research sabbatical to get things done, especially students nearing the end of um, their degree. So if they need that summer off and you need to have some kind of support, EDGE has been known to provide that. And the regional and cluster, regional clusters and workshops. So those are more of our smaller mentoring groups, you know, based on the region. So if you're closer together, you can meet with your EDGE family in that area. So we've had 22 sessions of EDGE. I participated in EDGE 2002. So this is me here. Standing next to me is my, the, also the other co-director, Allison Moore. So Allison became um, co-director this de December, not this December, this September. So Allison and I are now um, the EDGE co-directors. So they've passed the baton on and we are doing the work. I host, oops, I slow down right now. I hosted EDGE at uh, Texas Tech in 2018. So this is this photo. And as you see, this is 2020, there's a virtual photo there because we had EDGE, we just didn't have it in person because of COVID. So Amy Radinskaya, who was the last, um, or who Allison has replaced, we were committed to having EDGE. It just wasn't gonna be in the same setting, but we felt like it was necessary to have EDGE that you could not skip a summer. So instead of it being our normal four week in person, we had a six week virtual session. It was gruesome, but it was great because we learned that we can still create community via, as they say, the interweb. So it really worked out. Here are some fast facts about EDGE from 1998 to 2002. So we've had 283 participants, mentors, instructors. Some of those mentors, as well as some of those instructors are past edgers. We like to encourage edgers that have served about when they are done with their exams and working on their research to come and be mentors because they are, they can tell the current edgers, this is, this is what my experience was in edge. This is how this can prepare you. And this is what I'm doing now. The instructors as well. I served as an instructor from 2014 to 2017 and Allison was an instructor in 2017 and 2018. There's some demographic information. You see the background of the institutions that we, um, I'm not gonna say recruit from, but that the edgers come from. So 44% of the edgers come from a HBCU, a HSI or a women's college, a woman's college. And roughly 41% come from institutions that only offer baccalaureate degrees. These are our top five um, undergraduate institutions and the top five graduate institutions. I'm very happy to say that Xavier and University of Nebraska Lincoln are represented in both of those lists. So it's good. I think they are at UNL, I think there are now, well, now and have been about 12 edgers. So that's um, a pretty big deal. So this is some information for you. 
edges everywhere. So this is a map you can see just sometimes we like visuals instead of numbers. So you see where how edge has played, um, where edge has been the undergraduate institutions, the graduate institutions, and the host um, school. So we are pulling them in. Here's Lubbock right there. And it was important for me to host EDGE um, at Texas Tech shortly after I became co-director because I wanted my institution to know this is something that I value and it's something I'm going to continue to do. And those are things that continue to keep me connected and also to bring them in to learn about how to recruit minority students. There aren't that many minority students, especially black students um, in, well, there are none in our graduate program. And we, well, that's not, well, he is African, not African-American, I should say that. So, um, and there may be a handful or have been a handful of undergraduate majors that since I've been there. So it was important for me to have Texas Tech host um, EDGE shortly after I became co-director. It wasn't, we're gonna wait, like, no, we have to do this now. And they trusted me and they hosted. So it was great to have that. One thing that we learned that Rhonda and Sylvia both knew that when you bring this diverse group of women together, you need to be able to talk about more than mathematics. So they had something that was called, they started Difficult Dialogues and it began in 1999 at Bryn Mawr. And a lot of things they talked about were your social differences, your racial differences, economic, gender, and cultural. And the difficult dialogues is one of the things that is a core part, in my opinion, to the summer session. It happens at the very beginning. It's a safe space, but it allows the participants to really get to know each other because you haven't done any math together, right? I just see your picture and your bio on the website like everybody else's. But now I'm getting to know about Reagan. Now I'm getting to know about Allison. And you're going to talk about your self-awareness, the difference between an ally, an advocate, a mentor. We're going to talk about um, self-care. Those things that Sylvia and Rhonda knew that we needed that needed to be talked about at the beginning, it's become a very big thing now in 2018. So normally we have two sessions with them. One at the beginning, um, sorry, the first two days. In 2018, we had three sessions with them. And then in 2020, we had almost five sessions with them about difficult dialogues. Now, of course, we know what the world was like over the summertime, but it was important for them to feel like that they could be who them be themselves in this math space and that we supported those differences. So we had a licensed professional counselor come in the co-directors, the instructors, the mentors don't go. And they get to just put it all out on the table. And learning how to manage, that's something that has been, I know it was important for me during EDGE at the time, and I didn't realize how important it was until you see the newer group or the, you know, the newer EDGEs having to deal with these things that you have to talk about who you are and what your place looks like in mathematics. And we create that space. So it's, I like to say this, is learning to use your words, right? They have to learn how to use your words to speak up for yourself. You are your first advocate. And um, it's gone over very well. They love it. They're like, can we have more <laughs> difficult dialogue sessions? We need to talk about these things. And we don't claim to be the experts. We are the mathematicians and we're gonna put you in touch with those people who can help you work through these things. This coloring is a coloring sheet that says, I am enough. They learned how, you know, you always hear about, well, not always, but some people hear about adults doing coloring sheets. Well, in 2018, they did this. They colored and they ate candy. And they were like, I felt like such a little kid with no problems in the world, right? You could let all your vulnerabilities down. You could just be who you were. And they were like, that was so therapeutic. I needed that. So we found out that difficult dialogues is something that we have to do. You talk about imposter syndrome, you know, what it's going to be like in graduate school. All those things come in these sessions, but it's being intentional in creating the space to say, this is needed. And we can't just say, okay, you know, they're graduate students. We're here to take care of the math. We don't want to deal with social problems. Well, we know if you're not successful personally, then the math is going to suffer. So instead of throwing it off to the wayside and hoping that they figure it out. We say, let's teach you how to use your words. So that's something that had, is a core, core, a core part of EDGE. And as the world is changing, 
um, with COVID, with Black Lives Matters, all those things have become more important. And we've learned to say, this is the space and you can do that there. Okay. So the culture of mentoring, that is what, if you ask anybody about edge, you're gonna say that four week or that six week experience was tough. Those classes really took me through. So it's a, I got like to call it grad school boot camp. basically. You're in there for four weeks, you're gonna do heavy duty mathematics and you're gonna get feedback. The relief is there's no grade, but there's heavy duty mathematics. So we do introductory analysis, so baby reels, and we even go up to uh, papa reels, so we do measure theory. But what happens is that this informal mentoring structure comes into place. So you're mentored across the board from every single edge there is. If you say, I am an edge, okay, I got you, sister. We are going to do this. I'm going to find a way to support you even if I haven't had the same graduate school, even if we're taking in a different field, you have this tiered mentoring. So the co-directors mentor the instructors. And now that we are almost the same age, it's gonna be interesting, Allison, but we mentor the, the instructors, the instructors mentor the, the mentors, the mentors mentor the graduate students. So it's not formal, but it happens. And it's across all cohorts and all participants. And even when people haven't taught for EDGE for years, you're still connected to them because they are a part of this community. So it's important at those critical junctures when you're graduating, you know, you're going into your graduate program. Now you're graduating. Do I do a postdoc? Do I take a tenure track position? Do I go into the industry? We have people in all those areas and you can get that mentoring um, at every level. So that has definitely been important. And I know we use this mentoring word a lot and it's almost like, oh, they said mentoring, but it's, you have to do it. That's the only way that I would say the majority of us have survived graduate school was because we knew we had that tenure mentoring in the edge community. So, oops, slow down, Reagan. So what we do is stay connected. That's just what you have to do. You cannot, once you're in, you can't get out. If I know you're edge, I'm going to find you. I'm going to email you. I haven't seen you in a while. Even people that were in my edge cohort, you know, we don't make you feel as if you're not successful if you did not get the PhD. Yes, that was the ultimate goal, but life happens. We still wanna know what you're doing and how you're contributing to the math community, right? So if you got your master's degree, you've made a contribution. There are other people that did not do that. And we wanna know what you can bring or what you give to the edge community. So we, the top pictures at an AWM um, symposium, the bottom pictures, I think the bottom right was when this is edge 20, don't make me, edge 2016. I taught them, that's how I know exactly who that is. Edge 2016, when they were having their reunion. So a part of the summer session is that the second weekend, we call it the reunion weekend where the previous edgers come back and they talk to the current edgers and we check in with them. And that's really the first time that they've seen each other in a year. And you get to have this um, session where they tell us how the first year went, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we talk to them, okay, these are the next steps. And not that we're not in contact with this, we are definitely in contact with them throughout the year, but it's different when you're sitting down and you see these people that you've spent four weeks with and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to see you. And there's laughter, there's tears, we pass a tissue box, but we get it all out. Um, the one on the left, the bottom left is a social event. This is in DC. I believe, yes, that's in DC, of course, that's in DC. So we go on social events. So we wanna make sure that we stay connected mathematically, but as people, right? Do things that matter to us, that you're not gonna talk about math today. And of course you wanna ride on the bus ride, on the train ride. Did you do these problems? Mm -mm 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 -mm. We're not talking about math today. We want to have those releases to let them know that you are a person, you are a mathematician, you are a female, and we can deal with all the intersexuality as it goes. So here, come on, Reagan. Here's some, these are our numbers. So these are our degrees and broken down by type of degree and minority. So of the 283 participants, no degree means they did not get a degree or their current, you know, they didn't get a degree and then enrolled. Those are the students, the current, not current edges, but edges that have not graduated. So you see that 
we're doing pretty good, right? And we like to see that they're still enrolled, right? You are still there. You have not left. So we are happy with these numbers. The majority of them have gotten their PhDs and that was, that was Rhonda and Sylvia's initial goal to push you through. But to get through the pipeline, we have to make sure that these women know that there's an entry point and we're gonna help you at whatever entry point you choose. And whenever you choose, well, we don't say you, you never exit, right? Because once you're a woman mathematician, you're a woman mathematician. So we just wanna make sure that you're supported um, in your journey, whatever that looks like. The important thing to know is that our impact goes beyond just ourselves. I think that's very important. So these are not all of the activities, but these are some of the activities that Edris have done in terms of K through 12. So Sarah at the top, she's age 2002, started a math um, circle at Shippensburg. So you see her working um, with some students there. There's a thank you note to Dr. Meyer. So this is Ziva Meyer. Ziva went to Duke and she gave a um, geometry talk. It's called FEMS. FEMS stands for Females Excelling More in Math, Engineering and Science. And what's important about this is this thank you note. And I told Ziva this, that it shows your impact that the students realize it. And somebody says in this one, Peyton right here, it says, whoever thought math could be fun. We changed Peyton's mind about mathematics. Ziva gave a, a geometry talk using a soccer ball and we opened their mind up to the possibilities of what math can look like and, and the applications of the mathematics. And at the bottom, this is Omira Ortega. She's age 2001. She's done Sonia Kovaleski days everywhere she's been. So this is one of the, um, the most recent ones. Then, eh, these are activities for our undergraduates. So these are a variety of things that we've done. Math mentoring for women, Mathematics Mondays, uh, Hidden No More lecture series. So this bottom picture is from the Hidden No More lecture series that Allison Marr did. This is uh, Dr. Tanya Moore talking at that. And at the top is the Mathematics mentoring for women. So we are making impact at all the levels. We're chasing what I like to say not chasing, but you're pursuing your passion. Things that matter to you, you've also found a space for them um, inside of mathematics. There's also graduate students and professional mathematicians. So I'll talk about the career mentoring workshop for women. So Rachel DeCoast, here's Rachel here. She was in the first or second edge class. She was my mentor um, in edge 1998 in age 2002. So she started the career mentoring workshop for women. We have U stars at the bottom. Um, that's something that Candace Price does. Candace was not an edger, but she served as an edge mentor. So you're an edger. So that's something else that she's done. Then we have the research experiences for undergraduate faculty. Here's Yurka Wilson. Yurka was one of my mentors um, at edge. And that's something that she's done as well. So we found ways and sometimes creative ways to make sure that we are having an impact in the community um, that's beyond ourselves. So what I wanna end with is just those other places. So edgers are, uh, are in business. This is a 2009 edger, so data scientist, and she's only one of the 14 members that work in a Zillow research group. So it's also saying that we are not just on that academic path, we are doing um, other things. Chandra Erdman, age 2002. She used to work at the US Census Bureau. Now she works for Google. So this is great. She's using um, her statistics for Google. Carla Cartwright, age 2001, works for the Department of Defense. She participated um, in Paradigms as well for the representative for NAM. And she was also a former AMS Congressional Fellow. So we're doing things that are just not traditional academia. This is a research group, Heather Harrington. She just won a big award just this year. She um, is at Oxford. She runs this research group and she's doing outstanding things. You see that she won her award just this year. Farrah Jackson. So Farrah is more the academic, but she's in uh, administration. So she's worked up from department chair to now being provost. So we are using those things to make 
we're making changes in the community in which we are. This is a 2010 address, so more recently, she's a journalist actually. So she writes, or she covers healthcare for North Carolina Health News. She received her PhD from the University of Illinois in Chicago, but she's doing a different kind of mathematics, right? She's talking about healthcare for, or in North Carolina. Then Tatane, one of, she's one of my first babies because Edge 2014 is when I um, first taught. She got her PhD just recently from SUNY. But what's important is that she runs this, um, uh, maintains this blog. And the blog was solely to help her transition from undergraduate to graduate mathematics. So she's having, you know, difficulties with these problems. Let me blog about this. Let me see who I can help. It's well known. And she's also, I think she published a, with her advisor um, in a book. So they're doing, we are doing great things. Also, I'm sure you've seen this TED talk and also the book Power in Numbers by Talithia Williams. She's um, at Harvey Mudd. So we are finding and creating spaces to have impact um, in the mathematics community. EDGE has been recognized. It was recognized in 2014 by AMS. And recently we were recognized in 2018 with a Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics and Engineering Mentoring. And this was a big deal. This is right when I became, um, right after I became co-director and I was like, oh my gosh, all the weight that I'm gonna have to carry, all the work that Rhonda and Sylvia, so these are the original found, the founders and co-directors, and then Eureka and Amy did it together. It's like, oh my gosh, this is all the weight that I have to carry. But it's a good burden to have, right? That I am continuing on working in a space that wants women to be successful in mathematics. So these are our values. You have to have a community. You have to advocate. You want leadership and there has to be some mentoring. So as they say, keep calm and edge on. That's what we like to say. So you wanna have community, advocacy, leadership, mentoring. Those are the values of edge. And we found that those things work very well period, they work very well. We have been successful and what we are, uh, what Rhonda and Sylvia set out to do, we have definitely diversified the pipeline. I don't want you to read all these testimonials. This is what I'll end with, um, it's maybe four of them. But the first one says, participation in EDGE changed my life, period. That's all you can say there. My EDGE support encouraged me because they recognized my aptitude and talented for this new environment. So it's a new place. But we said, no matter about the new place, you know that you can do this. Rebecca from Edge 2017 says, Edge introduced me to an amazing group of women and gave me the support to not only survive, but thrive. And that's important. So it just wasn't about the survival, but she thrived in her first year of graduate school. And she served as a mentor in 2020. And we suspect that Rebecca will be graduating 2021, early 2022. This is a, um, a quote from Candace Price. The last one is from Carolyn Prichel. Carolyn served as the executive director um, for AWM. But what's important to me here that says there was a transparency that was more than just a window into graduate school, but was a transparency of ourselves into other participants. That's what we want to do. No matter how scary graduate school may be, we want to prepare them to tell them, this is what it's gonna be. And yes, you may be underprepared, but that does not mean that you cannot be successful. So let me give you the tools to be successful. And if I can't find them, there's somebody in my, if I don't have them, there's somebody in my community that has them and we can get them to you. Um, Erica Graham, role models, exceptional mentoring. These are key words. She said, basically edge is the gift that keeps on giving. And that is very true. At the bottom we have, this is from Shannon. And I like this when she said, the EDGE program hasn't stopped impacting me since I submitted my summer application. Even as a participant, I didn't see how EDGE is a long lasting community of support. It was hard to fathom how quick a summer program could change my life. But now it's impossible to fathom my life without it. So that happened in a short summer. These quotes come from um, the EDGE Re, uh, the Edge Anniversary Collection that was published by Springer. 
that came out in 2019. So after just doing EDGE for one year, or being in the EDGE community for one year, she says she can't fathom her life without EDGE. Mm -hmm. Change the slide. So as a co-director, I'll leave you with my vision. As we look to the future, we aim to have EDGE everywhere. We want people, institutions, and businesses to learn from and to implement the ideas and practices that EDGE has used to increase and to maintain the number of women and minorities in mathematics. Edgers are thriving in this community and we want the world to know how we can contribute to this success. So here is our website postcard just um, of an EDGE summer session. This is EDGE 2014. And here is, and my slides don't change, our EDGE logo. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's give uh, Dr. Higgins a big silent round of applause. Uh, if you stop your screen share, Reagan, then you'll be able to see everyone holding up their <laughs> hands. That was an excellent talk and I'm glad that we have time for questions because there are a lot already in the Slido. So okay. uh, let's just dive right in. So um, we have a question from Jonathan asking, is EDGE only for students who are undergrads? If I have women students who are currently in grad school, is there any way for them to connect with EDGE or are there similar programs for people who have already started grad school? So generally, Jonathan, we like to, we generally accept students who are just transitioning, right? That have just graduated and come in. We've had students that have been in graduate school um, and that have applied because they needed that extra time. So it's not a hard, fast rule. You apply and we look at the pool and we think about the diversity of what is gonna to add to the EDGE class, if that makes sense. So this past year, we had a, a participant that had already done a year, or maybe two that had already done a, a year of graduate school, but they added some diversity to the pool. So that's the general rule, but it's not a hard, fast rule. So I encourage anyone to apply, um, we, and even when, there's something that we started this year, I believe, I was going to correct me, but there were students that applied that could not get in. So what we did was get permission from the instructors and we shared those notes with them. So if you applied and you didn't get in, we said, okay, we're going to, we put an edge book together at the end of the year where the students compiled the lecture notes, the homework sets, pictures, all these activities. And once it was done, we said, welcome to the edge community in this way and we sent them an electronic copy of our uh, book so you can still get in right you can still be a part of the edge community you might not go through the summer session but we welcome as many people because honestly we only just for financially we can only support 14 students if we could support 28 students we would take them all but you can't so we want them to know that there is still space for them in the community and we will definitely um, support them. And we also encourage them to, if you get to a place, although you didn't do EDGE, if you're at a place where you wanna to apply to be a, a, a mentor, please do that as well because all mentors are not past edgers. So that's another entry point into the community. Great, okay, all right. Our next question from Justin. Uh, what do you see as the obstacles to math grad programs building supportive and ongoing communities for their students that are as successful as EDGE has been for its participants? Or what guidance would you give to faculty wanting to work in that direction? So that's a hard question and a not so hard question, right? At the same time, I think you have to be, well, first of all, you have to wanna know. And I don't mean at a surface level, but you genuinely have to want to know. And you have to understand that this is not something that's going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen like, you know, you're going to have to go and meet the students that you are recruiting. So that means going to an HBCU. Don't just send me this flyer in the mail, right? Come to where I am. Learn about where your students come from. Number one. Number two, when you have those students in your graduate program that are few and far between, take to heart what they're saying, right? This is the experience I, I gave you my experience of how I got to UNL, why I was successful at UNL. I didn't necessarily share some of my barriers, but I had some barriers and how they helped me overcome those barriers. Take those things into account 
and want to do something about it. And I think the hard part is that we are so one track mind and graduate school has to look like this. And hmm, the research is so important. It is, but if you're not going to continue, somebody has to say, yes, I am the bomb researcher, but I'm gonna to have to put that down and I'm gonna to have to devote my energy into recruitment and that is my job. I don't feel like graduate departments are willing to make that someone's job. And I also don't feel like faculty members are willing to say, this is my job. Because honestly, they didn't get a PhD to do this, right? I got a PhD to do, I didn't get a PhD to be, to help you recruit. That's what the graduate advisor or there's a staff member's job. That is a part of their job, but to see, to be successful in that, you're gonna have to make that your job. And a part of that is, because those are the students you're teaching, right? So when they come to that classroom, you have to be able to reach your students. Just so when you teach your undergraduates, I say this all the time, I'm getting older, but my students are staying the same age. I have to get on Snapchat, I have to get on Twitter, I don't wanna do these things, but I have to get on there to learn about what's happening in their world. Students have to have an entry point. So I have to find out, okay, this is what's happening in the world. Or there's some parties on campus. Talk to my friends, you know, what happened? Because then the students know, okay, she's a person, right? And then they trust me being the expert in the room. Because a lot of times they, oh, this is this lady that's gonna come and teach me this. Okay, let me just get that. No, I know what you're doing, Bianca. I heard about the party. Oh, we lost the football game. This is what happened, you know. You have to let them know that this is a part of your community too, that I am not just here. And especially when COVID happened, I tell my students all the time, you get to leave, right? If, some, if the university closes, you leave. This is my home. So just like I have to care about Lubbock and Texas Tech, just like you do. So I care about the people that are here, the choices that they are making, because this is where I live. So you have to be able to connect with your students on a level, in my opinion, that's outside of academics. So that means going to those places, learning about those people that you're recruiting, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, she had these struggles, he had these struggles, because some students don't have struggles, they are financially okay, you know, but still the environment that they came from. So sending a piece of paper in the mail, that's nice, that's the entry point, but just like you go on trips to, just like students come to your, in, to your institution to see what it's like, you should go to that institution and say, okay, these are the students that are going to be coming here and figuring out ways to make relationships with the department chairs of those undergraduate institutions. And now this is going to be so trivial, but we have Zoom now, right? So you can do all this recruitment very simple, easily. If there's a senior seminar, you say, okay, let's go to senior seminar. I'm going to talk about 15 minutes about what happens at UNL. I'm going to talk about what happens at Iowa. You can do that. So it's, you got to touch people. I think a personal connection is more important than anything. Having that experience going to the summer program was great. But how did I have that personal experience? Because my advisor sent me to the conference and Dr. Pease and Dr. Irving said, oh, you're working on something that's related to what I'm doing. So they came to my talk and they're like, you should do this. And it just kept building on personal experiences. And those personal experiences say, okay, I can go work with them. Okay, I can stay. Okay. I can stay because I'll be honest, I'm like, mm, I'm ready to go. I don't know if I have what it takes. I don't know if I have what it takes. Talk me off the ledge. But it was those personal experiences that said, Reagan, I knew you when you couldn't do any of this, when this was a new thing to you. Now you're getting better. So you're just going to have to keep growing. Those personal experiences, in my opinion, are what matter. Thank you. That was great. From Paige, we have a question. How would you talk to faculty about creating spaces in the department that are not math-centered, but person-centered? How would you broach bringing in outside experts? Sometimes people get offended when you suggest that math should not be centered or that they are not experts in a non-math field. Okay, um, I have to be, a part of me is like, so? Like, okay, you, you, get, you get offended, right? That's fine, but you have, you're not gonna be an expert at everything and it's okay. It's just, accept what you don't know. You don't know how to do this, but if you care enough, then find the people that can deal, that can help your students to do these things. I'm not, I don't know. I'm not interested in just knowing it all. I don't have to be the know it all, but I know enough to know what I don't know. And I know enough to go get the resources that I need. And I think that's what's missing. 
that this is a, a conversation that has to be had, but you need the advocates, right? So there's going to have to be potentially a white woman, a white man to say, I recognize these in my students. But this is the interesting part too, and I hate when people say this. It's not just your black students or your Hispanic students that are having these issues. Your white students are having these issues too, flat out. They are just in the majority, right? So you don't necessarily notice. But when your black students and your Hispanic students are being supported, your white students thrive just as well. So it, don't think about it as I'm just helping the black students. No, you're helping everybody, honestly. You can frame it however you want to frame it to say, okay, now I'm going to do this and be my diversity work. But in your diversity work, you're helping everybody. And that's something I think culturally that mm, we just use our words a little bit more, right? I'm not, and, and personally, I'm not as passive. I'm, I, I, you know, I respect authority. I know that I'm going to say, okay. So for example, um, this is very personal. So Jim Lewis was the chair when I was at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. I was ready to go. Like, I ain't got it. I'm not passing these exams. And Jim was like, so I had a conversation with Jim. And I was like, well, Jim, this is what I need. And he's like, okay, Reagan, let me talk to you the way you talking to me. And I was like, oh, okay. So Jim had to come and meet me where I was. And I was like, okay, I respect that. You're not gonna sign this paper, so I'm gonna make it another semester, right? So he understood that that surface level talk didn't mean anything to me. I needed you to see me. So he was being the department chair. And now I need you to see me as a person and recognize these struggles. And he's like, okay, let me talk to you the way I see you walking around this department. Thank you. And that personal relationship and him being willing to step out and say, this is what it is. This is the aura you're giving off. This is the attitude that you're having. These things are affecting you positively and negatively. So somebody has to be willing to just speak the truth, period. And it can be your truth. This is, that was his perception of me. And there was some validity to that. So then it was my job to say, hmm, sit back and think about what Jim has said to me and what can I do about that? Because if he sees this, then other people are seeing it as well. But you have to be, as we call it, courageous conversations. You have to be willing to have the courageous conversation because in the end, the benefit is far greater than five minutes of being uncomfortable. So faculty members just know that you are not the expert but there are people that are experts and we're not asking you to know everything. We're asking you to recognize that there's a need there and then let's ask the, white co the correct questions to get the needs met. Great. That was so amazing. Um, Okay, I feel like I'm gonna like pause more to take that in, but there's also so many questions. I just gotta keep Sorry. going. Um, so uh, there's a question here that I think is really a lot of us are struggling with right now and asking about what virtual activities were the most effective to create community during the last EDGE program. Oh, uh, Allison, so you can unmute yourself. I'm giving Allison permission to unmute herself. So we did things like, so Allison is more, she was our social person. I'm not, I'm just like, let's get, and this is true. And this is where you need this balance. This is not a perfect example of balance. I'm like, let's come get to the business. And I'm a person too that likes separation between my lives. Like I'm Dr. Higgins, I'm Mrs. Sawatu. I'm, I like this separation of my lives. And then I had to learn that you're gonna have to merge some of these things together. So they're like, well, we're gonna be social. So we watched movies together. We did karaoke. Oh, we did a scavenger hunt. Allison, what else did we do? I mean, lots of things. Oh, she, is she typing? I think. Uh, she yeah, uh, we did game night. I think we did some game, game night. Uh, uh, we actually got dressed up for dinner one day. So at the end of Edge, we have this fancy dinner, right? But you can go anywhere. So we told everybody to get dressed up in your best dress up, set the table, get your wine, your placemats, all your good dishes, and just, just let's have a meal. And we all got dressed up just to do just what we're doing. But it was fun, right? So we talent tried show. to do those things that are, yeah. Oh, we had on one of the talent shows too. Their talent shows, we usually have a talent show at Edge and that shows us the non-math side of them. And they actually, it was hilarious. It was really hilarious. And they did cooking shows. So they showed us like some of them sing well, some of them act well, they bake well. So we had all these demonstrations of food and then you're like, oh, I'm gonna go try to make that. And then I'm gonna show you, look, I made this. So it's this, 
it's almost do the things that you would want to do in person. Honestly, what do you want to know about Allison? What do you want to know about Bianca? Create those things in that space and then just realize that it's going to be on the computer, but don't take it for granted. So if you would get dressed up for dinner, go get dressed up for dinner. And we just got dressed up and we had tablecloths on the table, just like you went to this fancy restaurant in your house. But it was just so fun, the idea to, and especially during that time, we hadn't worn makeup in a while. I was like, I'm gonna put some lipstick on. Like it was just exciting um, to get dressed up. So the things that you still care about, you just have to find out the venue um, for them. And then along that same line, you have to respect Zoom fatigue. So that's why Edge was six weeks instead of four weeks because they're having class, problem session, all these things via the web. So we said, okay, I'm not gonna ask you to sit in front of a computer for, for all day. So it was harder for it to be six weeks, but we definitely know that was the thing to do. And also you had four different time zones. So you gotta find that perfect time to get everybody to meet. And that was like, oh, that's too early. Oh, that's too late. Oh, well, this is what it gotta be. Okay, you know, so you have to figure it out. So you have to be flexible. Okay, I'm gonna squeeze in uh, one more question, I think. Um, so what do you think about individual departments incorporating these types of difficult dialogue sessions into the standard welcome process for incoming grad students? Is this something that you have seen other grad students do? or you've done in your program? So no, I don't know of any that have done it. Um, I'm on the graduate committee at Texas Tech, but I have not, so no, I have not implemented that. I've kind of saved that. We have what's YWM, which is now a uh, women's uh, chapter of AWM. So I kind of saved that for AWM, our women's group, that we have these kind of conversations um, in our women's group. But I think it's definitely, worthwhile, you'll get to know your participants, your grad participants, your students um, then. Yeah, and I think it's a conversation that faculty should be willing to have too, to say, I don't know about the economic needs or the cultural needs. So when you know there's a student that's coming in from wherever, you may need to learn about specific things about these students, right? So you know, if they have religious holidays, they'll say, well, you know, they can't come to class for these things. But that's something a part of my teaching. So I asked my students that in the beginning. Are there any religious holidays or whatever, whatever, okay? And then they might fill it out, you know, they answer the question. And then I go learn something about that. So then in my mind, I know this is happening at this time. Or she may be fasting or he may be fasting at this time. So don't, ex that's just, to me, that's a part of care, honestly. It's not so much of a graduate program. That's a part of who I am as an educator that I just need to know who's in my classroom. So if you do that same thing for your students, so when these certain times of year happen, you're like, okay, they are not gonna respond or this is the time when they need to go pray. And those things happen. We had that experience in Edge, Edge 2016. It was like, okay, and then they just educated us. Like, you know about it on the surface level, but we had two um, participants and they're like, this is what's gonna happen. I cannot eat this time, I'm gonna fast this time. So you learn how to respect their boundaries. And they're like, well, don't change what you're doing for me. Not necessarily that I'm gonna change what I'm doing, but I'm gonna respect what's, hap respect what's happening in your life. And if you want a flip side, you will want those same things. So I think those things are not unreasonable. You, you just need to be intentional in saying, this is what I wanna do. And then you make a more welcoming space. And we know graduate programs are successful because students say, I had a good experience. So the, the more good, and it's gonna sound good, the good non-math experiences you create, that's really gonna help students say, I felt that I was supported as a person. And then I could be great in my math or I knew who I could come and talk to about X, Y, and Z. And it's not so much of a superiority or a ranking thing. We're all people, right? And I'm aspiring to be where they are. So I would like to think that they would be willing to help me to get there. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to think which, if we can squeeze one more in, let me just scroll quickly. Okay, here's it. Well, maybe this is a tough question. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, maybe let me, because uh, <laughs> I don't want everyone to leave before we get a chance to thank you again, because the talk was so great and um, the questions were so great. So let's uh, give Dr. Higgins a big round of applause again, silent round of applause. Thank you.
And um, so maybe I'll ask one more question and then we'll transition to sometime in the middle, like maybe some breakout rooms or some networking in between. And if you need to go take a break or a meal break, um, then we look forward to seeing you back for our two parallel sessions at um, 4 p.m. Eastern. I think I did the time zone, <laughs> right? Okay, great. Uh, so maybe here's a, the question I was going to ask is in building a supportive community, would you still recommend recruiting minorities if the program does not currently feel particularly supportive? Or how might you try to improve the, improve the program slash community otherwise? So that's the hard question. And okay. Somebody, this is this is tough. Um, somebody's gonna have to be first, right? It's just so you can't wait to do it because it'll never happen, period. So yes, I do think you should do it, do it. However, period, you need to find what other entities in that or in your university that support minority students. So when I went to University of Nebraska, I don't know how many minority students there were before me. I just remember two young ladies that were there when I got there. That's it. So there were two that were there and Christine and I came together. So what did we do? We found our space outside the math department, right? You had to find things outside the math department. I don't recall the math department saying these are the things that existed for you because they just probably didn't think. And you have to give people some kind of grace, right? Because they don't know what they don't know. And if you never had to do something, you just don't know how to do it. Okay. So they didn't say this is the B, you know, the BGSA, or these are the, these are the black churches. These are the, you know, I, these are the hair salons. I had to go figure those things out. Now I think that should just be commonplace. When you are recruiting minority students, and even recruiting them, when they, that's something that you should give students. You can say, okay, yes, you can go find this on the internet. I can, I can go search the website. But what does it tell me that you've done this for me, that you care about my well-being? You know, I want you to know that I support you in these things. And yes, I'm advocating, and maybe you aren't, but I'm, I'm an advocate of having a life outside of mathematics. Do just a little bit of something else to maintain your sanity. So I um, did sorority work. I worked, I volunteered at my church. I did those things because that was important to me. I was a president, uh, officer in our Black Graduate Student Association. We volunteered at a middle uh, elementary school. So yes, you should advocate, recruit, but you need to do a lot of work to make sure that that student knows that these are the things that are in place for them um, to be successful. So you're gonna have to go ask some questions. And if I, that you asked this, one of our, a previous mentor, a previous edger, and was a mentor, wrote me to be a, a recommender. And the person called, the, you know, the department called me and he, he, and he was very transparent. He was like, okay, so this is what I know and this is what I don't know. And all these suggestions that I'm giving you, I said, do you know people on campus? Where can she go get her hair done? Where would she go shopping? Where's the places that she would live? What are community groups? And he was like, yeah, I never thought about any of this. But he asked the question, that wasn't the direct question, but I, we went along this line. I said, but this is the thing. When you go to a new space, don't you wanna know all these things? He said, yes. Then he said, but it's easier to find for me. So make it easier to find for her. Make it easier to find. For, and it doesn't have to be about black students. It could be about any student, honestly. Or wait, make those things because make those things easier to find for them. It just and what happens is when you're doing that, you learn. You learn about things that your city offers that you didn't know about, right? You learn about the students. It's a basically it's constant education. You can't say. I figured this all out. You might know this mathematics, but there's a whole big world outside of your mathematics. And that part you have to know because that's what keeps people in, right? And you can be great, but if you haven't figured out how to connect, I mean, think about our students, they'll say, oh, she was a great teacher. He was a great teacher, but he just didn't have any people skills. Those students don't, when you have those experiences or too many of those people in your department, your students may get the degree, but they don't send anybody else there. And you say, well, why are there more students coming? Because, you yeah, know, I'm just an advocate of a whole person. 
And that's just what's necessary. You have to see the whole person. So yes, recruit those students, but do a lot of the work, right? You're gonna have to go do some work. And that goes along with what I said about there being a faculty member's job to say, okay, I gotta go learn these things. It's, it's education. And you have, it's one thing I'll say, and mathematicians don't like this either, but they are math educators, right? Those, those people that you have across your campus that know all these things. Don't downplay, disregard, disrespect their EDDs. They worked to get that degree, just like you worked to get yours. Your specialization is just different. It doesn't mean that there's less value to it. That's something that upsets me beyond degree when they say, oh, well, they just have an EDD. Do you know what they know? No. So don't disregard what they do. That's their specialization. And those people teach those students that are in your classrooms, right? So they are responsible for getting you those freshmen. They're responsible for getting you those graduate students. So reach out to them. They can definitely teach you things. Even in my grant writing and my collaborations, I've had to go over to the college education and be like, okay, this is what I want to know. They're like, Reagan, what? What is this founded in? I don't know. This is just what I want to know. So help me figure these things out. And then you learn things. And I have uh, two young children. So I look at my, they're in, I don't know what grade they're in, second and fourth grade. And my daughter last year in her third grade class, they didn't have desks. They had more like kitchen tables and that's how they learned. And it bothered me. I was like, why do you not sit down and you have your structure? But then it made sense because my college, some of my college freshmen had the hardest time sitting in the desk. I had a student that he was like, I just need to sit on the floor. Why are you sitting on the floor? Okay. My daughter does these same things. So somebody taught you and you went through school this way. So for him, and he was a good student, he just didn't fit into that normal structure of you sit in a desk and you do things. But I have young children, so I'm aware of these things. And I also talk to my math ed colleagues about things that are happening in my classroom. So that better prepares me for what I'm gonna see next. So I don't say, I know how to teach. I know mathematics. Yes, I know that to a degree, but the students are changing. The world is changing. So let me talk to the people that are constantly doing that work. So when I get these new students, okay, this is what's happening in the world. This is the way they're teaching. I need to adjust. You can't teach the same way. It can be the same content. You can't teach to your 10 o'clock class the same way you talk to your 12 o'clock class because it's different students. So that happens. You have to be willing to adjust. And I don't think that, and uh, Bill said this yesterday, math is not one size fits all. You gotta be willing to adjust. And that's just what it is. And yes, it takes more time. You're like, I don't wanna put this much time in my teaching. I don't wanna do all these things. Then you get the results you get. And you're gonna be in the same department as things are gonna, so you have to be willing to do personal work. And then if everybody does their personal work, then you'll be able, you'll see these changes in the department everywhere because then you have the buy-in and everybody buy, buy everyone's buy-in doesn't have to look the same. I'm going to make this change. Ellen's going to make this change. Justin's going to make this change. Well, all those small changes add up to a big change. So, but you got to be willing to do work that's outside of your expertise. And I feel like academia is just not that way. They're like, oh, I'm doing my math and I'm just going to do my math. Okay. Where you won't have any changes in your place. And you've made a conscious decision not to do that. So when the results don't change, don't be surprised.